All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Isaiah chapter 57. We're going to see uh, some spiritual adultery of God's people here. All right, verses 1 and 2. The righteous perishes, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Okay, so carrying on the rebuke of Judah's leaders from the previous chapter, uh, chapter 56, the Lord speaking to the persecution of the righteous. In this case, it is persecution through neglect. And so when Isaiah proclaimed this is important, many critics of the Bible demand that Isaiah was written after the Babylonian exile because so many events after the exile were precisely prophesied. So they're like, well, it must have happened after. Well, that's not how prophecy works. Prophecy isn't when you go back and you're like, oh, yep, that's just how, that's how it happened. Um, but the sins described in this chapter are strictly before the exile. This chapter is a marvelous proof that the book of Isaiah was written in the days of Isaiah by one author and before the exile. All right, And there is zero evidence of corresponding post-exile practices. A prophet in the post-exile could not have written like this. All right. Verses 3 through 10, the spiritual adultery of God's people. Verse 3. But come here, you sons of the sorceress, you offspring of the adulterer and the harlot. Whom do you ridicule? Against whom do you make a wide mouth and stick out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression, offspring of falsehood, inflaming yourselves with gods under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys, under the clefts of the rocks, among the smooth stones of the stream? Is your portion they, they are your lot? Even to them you have poured a drink offering, you have offered a grain offering. Should I receive comfort in these? On a lofty and high mountain you have set your bed. Even there you went up to offer sacrifice. Also behind the doors in their post you have set up your remembrance. For you have uncovered yourself to those other than me, and have gone up to them. You have enlarged your bed and made a covenant with them. You have loved their bed where you saw their nudity. You went to the king with ointment and increased your perfumes. You sent your messengers afar off and even descended to Sheol. You are wearied in the length of your way, yet you did not say there is no hope. You have found the life of your hand, therefore you were not grieved. So the wicked among God's people made fun of the righteous, which is evident today as well. They mocked them, and God heard it, so God's going to challenge them, uh, basically saying, who do you think you are? Um, and this is, here the Lord is beginning to expose spiritual adultery of his people. They are hot with passion for other gods, worshiping them in a ritual worship, places of Canaanite paganism. And so, in this picture, the Lord is the husband of Israel, and their passionate chronic attraction for idols was like their lust of an adulterer. And so his people pursued the false gods like a lover runs after the focus of uh, of their love. And so they yielded themselves to idols rather than you know the one that they were sworn to. And according to the presentation of verse 7, the whoredom of Judah is compared to that of an adulteress who has been become so impudent that she no longer commits her sins in secret, but now publicly and shamelessly. And so the picture of spiritual adultery is fitting. Because many of the pagan gods the Israelites went after were worshipped with debased sex rituals. Okay. <clears throat> and so one of the Canaanite gods the Israelites worshipped was named Moloch, and he received children as sacrifices. Moloch was worshipped by heating a metal statue representing the god until it was red hot, then by placing a living baby in the outstretched hands of the statue while beating drums to drown out the screams of the child until it burned to death. Moloch was one of the lovers uh, God's people forsook the Lord for in their spiritual adultery. And so people who would not make a small sacrifice for the Lord God would kill their own children for a pagan idol. Okay. And so these are the sacrifices that should have been given to the Lord. Um, a grain offering, the drink offering. Uh, but his unfaithful people gave to their own children to idols instead. A drastic different. Um, 
So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, God told Israel to inscribe his name and his word on every doorpost. Here, there was a perverse twisting of that. They remembered their pagan gods behind the doors and their posts. And so as time went on, this spiritual adultery of God's people wasn't rewarding. After that initial thrill of their adultery wore off, they were wearied. But even so, they wouldn't repent. All right, verse 11 through 13, we're going to see the end of God's patience with his people. Verse 11, And of whom have you been afraid or feared, that you have lied and not remembered me, nor taken it to your heart? It is not because I have held my peace from of old, that you do not fear me. I will declare your righteousness and your works, for they will not profit you when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry them all away. A breath will take them. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So here the Lord is going to confront the fact that his people do not fear him and that they do fear someone or something else. So their superficial relationship was connected to a low view of God and their lack of respect for him. And so this is in part because he showed mercy and did not punish their sin immediately. So they made an error uh, common to fallen humanity. They mistook God's mercy and forbearance for weakness or lack of resolve. So they didn't trust in him and God. And the things they did trust in, which was themselves and their idols, couldn't help them. And this is a contrast to those who turned away from God, uh, who puts his trust in me, shall possess the land, shall inherit my holy mountain. Trust in the Lord makes a person secure, while trust in oneself or idols will end in total ruin. All right, verse 14, we're going to see a stumbling block removed. Verse 14, and one shall say, heap it up, heap it up, prepare the way, take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. So this doesn't describe setting things in the way of those coming to God. Instead, it's describing a highway for God's people, meaning a raised road that's above all the obstacles. Heap it up refers to the building of this road so that God's people can return to him without obstacle. And so whatever gets in the way of our getting right with God needs to be taken out of the way. In the following verses, the Lord's going to deal with those obstacles. All right, verse 15 through 21. God's going to describe the way of peace and restoration. Verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him. I hid and was angry, and he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways, and I will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So to be right with God, the first thing to do is to understand his great majesty. The Lord introduces himself to his people with titles that reflect his great majesty, and he expects his people to respond to him as such a glorious God. And so though God is a high and lofty one who lives in a high and holy place, uh, at the same time he's going to live with men, with him who has contrite and humble spirit. And this is the second thing to being right before God, being contrite and humble before the God of a great majesty. All right, we've got to put ourselves in the right place. The third thing to understand is his great love. The Lord's going to show his mercy to his people, but promises to relent and not be angry forever. Though God disciplined his people, now he's saying, I've seen his ways and will heal them. I will also lead them and restore comforts to him. And so God's going to invite all of his men to peace, both who is afar off and near. Each one can receive God's peace, which is more than just an absence of hostility. It is the gift of precious well-being. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17, Paul speaks of Jesus fulfilling this promise exactly. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. 
As revealed through Paul, God shows that him who is afar off refers to the Gentiles, while him who is near is the Jewish man. Both can come to peace through receiving God's gift through Jesus. And so in contrast to those who return to God, the wicked are still without peace. God's great mercy is held out to man, but it must be received. And so Isaiah 57 verses 20 and 21 is a good example of how the sea was thought to be a very dangerous, dark, and restless place in the mind of the ancient Jews. No wonder that in the new heaven and in the new earth there is no more sea in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. All right, and that's chapter 57. Thank you for joining me.